story of the white caps in Sevier County is is a portion of Sevier County's history that not everybody is uh, interested in discussing. Uh, in some ways, it's a black spot, but history is history, and and you more or less have to uh, deal with it, identify it, and move on. The White Cap story is a a narrative that rivals any good work of fiction that I think I've ever been around. It has everything you need. It has good guys, it has bad guys, it has intrigue, it has uh, all the elements that a good work of fiction has. I have to say that I had never heard of the Whitecaps until one rainy day when I was doing a newspaper story in a neighboring county and Richard Way who I knew, uh, called out to me and suggested he wanted me to do a book and we dis discussed it. And he that's the first mention I had ever heard of the Whitecaps. My dad always said, if you don't know where you came from, you don't know where you are and you don't know where you're going. Uh, when I was a teenager, I played in rock and roll bands and I played as a union musician. And I played on the Kaz Walker Hour. So, Many times I would sit on a great big roll of canvas in the studio and Kaz would actually come up and sit down and he'd have all these wild tales to tell me. Well, I was very impressionable, so I listened and then I actually started taking notes. So over a period of time, I developed this real interest in the white caps and the bluebills. So over a period of my lifetime, I gathered quite a lot of information uh, and then I decided, you know, this needs to be preserved for history. So I commissioned uh, Bob Wilson, met him in a parking lot, and got to talking to him and decided, you know, this guy has been an investigative reporter for the newspaper, he's been an editor, he's the person that could put all this together. It sounded interesting to begin with, and so I told him I would poke around a little bit and see what I could come up with. It started out with a good purpose, or at least a good purpose, in the minds of the individuals who formed the group. Uh, they took it upon themselves to stamp out what they felt like was immoral conduct in a certain section of the county. Somebody had decided that they should go over there and with some switches they called wides and call them out in the middle of the night, give them a whipping and make sure they went back where they came from. And specifically, that's what they did. They soon attracted an element of people that um, took a stronghold of the organization. And before long, it, it was just a terrifying organization that uh, terrorized the entire county for many years. Eventually, the Whitecaps had permeated the county structure so much that they were in government, they were in law enforcement, they were in uh, the court system, which made it virtually impossible to either prosecute or arrest these people. And essentially, they were first, uh, such a fearsome group that nobody dared cross them. When I came along more than a half a century later, it was still a hush-hush topic because there were a lot of relatives at that time, some of the White Cap members were still living. and. Certainly some of the children of the White Cap members were still around at that time, so very little was written about it in the, in the newspapers. And we had a county historian at one time who refused to acknowledge their existence. One of the stories that's uh, really prevalent is how uh, a lady had two daughters and uh, the White Caps had pulled the two daughters out and were whipping them and the mother protested so violently that they decided it was a good thing just to whip her and teach her a lesson. I'm Mary Catherine Kathy Breeden, the great-granddaughter of Mary Breeden, who was the first fatality uh, attributed to the Whitecaps. This was not a story that came down uh, through our family. 
It was something uh, around the early 1990s. I was doing family history. I was actually in a bookstore in Gatlinburg and I ran across the Crozier book, which is, I believe, the first uh, account of the Whitecaps in Sevier County. I had never heard of the Whitecaps. I had um, also never heard of this incident involving my great-grandmother. But when I looked at the chapter in the book called The Whipping of Mary Breeden, uh, you know, I was just shocked. Uh, there was uh, my grandfather, Jesse. There were two great aunts uh, in the story, um, Belle and Martha. And uh, I was just stunned that, that this terrible thing had happened uh, to my great-grandmother. Incidentally, the last known survivor of the White Caps was one of the people that was involved with that. I remember uh, at the time, I was a teenager when he passed on, and I remember hearing people of my grandmother's generation in sort of whispered tones saying, well, that's the last of the White Caps. I guess I'm here today to, in a way, to honor her. Um, it's when you read something like that, you do want to step back in time and try. You want to go back and make things better for for the people involved, for my great grandmother, for my grandfather, for the two great aunts. But of course, you can't do that. Um, so. Um, so I, I'm so happy that, um, uh, that this book, Eyes of Midnight, has been published uh, to keep this story um, in, uh, in, in the public eye. The final act of the White Caps that had any significance at all was a, a particularly brutal double murder of a young couple, not even 20 years old, who had a, an infant daughter. There were tenant farmers working for Bob Catlett, who owned a good deal of property. Laura Whaley, whose maiden name was the same as mine, McMahon, said some things uh, publicly about Bob Catlett that he didn't like. And it, it was very obvious to a lot of people that Bob Catlett was involved in white caps. So he decided to take matters in his own hand and he sent Pleswin and Catlett Tipton out to the Whaley's farm to uh, to take care of matters. Now whether he asked them to kill the couple or to scare them, we don't know. But the end result was that both of them were murdered. The two men who, who were paid to do that were the ones who were hung on this courthouse lawn all those years ago, in 1899 to be specific. Laura Whaley's sister was in the house at the time and she laid very quietly and uh, they did not realize that she was there, and she was able to identify Pleswin and Catlett Tipton on the public square a couple of days later, and then they were brought to trial. They were given the opportunity to be, to be baptized if they so desired. So Pleswin uh, accepted that and was taken to the river, which was just behind the jail at the time, and was baptized before a large audience. So there's a picture that exists of that to this day of the baptism of Pless Wynn, which has become an iconic photograph in the history of Sevierville. And um, Catlett Tipton chose not to, but uh, he, he was baptized and then the following day he was uh, hanged. They were brought before trial and there were lots of people uh, summoned to, to testify. Among them was the sheriff, uh, Millard Fillmore Maples, and during his testimony, he had said something that offended Pleswin's family. So after that day of testimony, William Wynn, a brother of Pleswin, met Sheriff, Hoy Sheriff Maples in, in an alley near the courthouse, and a confrontation occurred. Guns were drawn, and William Wynn ended up dead on the street there. So the day that Pleswin was on trial and the final arguments were being made in the courthouse, the funeral procession of his brother passed by the courthouse on the way to Shadow Cemetery for an internment. I'm certainly glad that it's, uh, that it's being retold and it's been retold so well. Uh, my grandmother experienced, my great-grandmother experienced a horrible death and so if this uh, story means that uh, in the current time that we can avoid 
something like that happening to somebody else, then, uh, then I think you've accomplished uh, what you set out to do with your book. The story involves a community that, it, when you think of 1,500 white caps in a community that had 6,000 voters, uh, roughly, that, that in itself is significant of how that evolved. And it, it's American history. The experience that one person had on Wednesday is not the same experience as someone had on Friday. And, and that's what this whole story is about, is how did all that change over time? How did it grow to be 1500? How were these, all these different people that were brought to justice but then never were convicted? How did they get out of it? Nobody would, would talk about it much. Uh, nobody wanted to be identified as a white cap. And so the people who uh, had knowledge of it never even talked about it, much less write it down. And that's what made the research for this so much more in, uh, difficult. What I did was go to about five or six different sources uh, and meld the information together along with using um, a uh, a genealogy website uh, and, and try to put this story back into chronological order into some kind of cohesive story that could be told as a story and that's what that's what the, the eyes of midnight is designed to be